Christmas is a, a time when men and women eat and drink and make merry, supposedly to celebrate the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. But in spite of these widespread festivities, it is, I believe, a sad fact that very few people really understand the purpose behind the birth and the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, even in our supposedly Christian country. So what we propose to do this evening is to open the Bible and see what it says to us about the reason for the coming of Jesus and especially the benefits that this can have for each one of us. So can we turn, first of all, please, in our Bibles to Luke's Gospel and chapter 2, Luke chapter 2, and almost certainly in the days leading up to Christmas Day, we will have heard some or all of these words from the Bible, because this is the story of the birth of Jesus. And in verse 10 of Luke chapter 2, it says here that the angel said unto them, that is the shepherds in Bethlehem, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, which is Christ the Lord. And so here in these words that the angel speaks to the shepherds, we have the reason for the birth of Jesus. He was born to be a saviour. And the angel said that this was good tidings of great joy to all people. And, and that all people can include us today, as we shall see. And this is what our lecture title suggests. We can rejoice in the hope of salvation. Now, this is all very well, we might say, but what exactly do we need to be saved from? Because we might be uh, very content, very happy with our lot in life, and we might not appreciate that we need to be saving from anything. So what is it that we need to be saved from? Well, let's have a look now at Matthew's account of the birth of Jesus, part of which we've just read together in Matthew chapter 1, because there we shall find out because here the angel of the Lord is speaking to Joseph, who was betrothed to be married to Mary, the, the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the angel says to Joseph in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 20, he says, While he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And so here the angel of the Lord explained to Joseph that Jesus was to come to save people from their sins. That was the whole purpose of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, to save people from their sins. Now, sin is today a, a rather unpopular concept in this day and age, where we're, we're encouraged to think that we can live out our lives exactly how we please, without regard to anybody else. But this isn't what the Bible says. The Bible tells us a lot about sin. And the Bible tells us that sin is disobedience to God's law. Uh, and it is something that affects every single member of the human race. And it has very far reaching consequences for everybody. Because the Bible teaches us that with the exception of the Lord Jesus Christ, every single man and woman that has ever lived to maturity has committed sin. The, the wise man Solomon in the Old Testament, he said, there is no man that sinneth not. 
And the Bible explains to us to us that it is because of sin that death exists. Just have a look at these words that were penned by the Apostle Paul when he was writing to the believers at Rome. Paul said, wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And so the Apostle Paul explains here that sin was introduced into the world by one man. And that one man, the Bible tells us, was Adam, who disobeyed the commandment of God when he ate of the forbidden fruit. And we read about that event right at the beginning of the Bible in the book of Genesis. And the consequence of Adam's disobedience was that he brought upon himself the sentence that he should die and return to the dust from whence he had created, he had been created. And in the book of Genesis chapter three, God said to Adam, because thou hast eaten of the tree, which I commanded thee saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Now, every single man and woman that has ever lived has descended from Adam and Eve. And so by inheritance, therefore, the whole of the human race has shared Adam's nature. The consequences being that, first of all, we all sin and eventually we all die, as the Apostle Paul said. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. And so this is what we need to be saved from. We need to be saved. We need salvation from sin and the consequence of sin, which is death. Because if you think about it, the only absolute certainty that we have in this life is that one day we shall die. Uh, and Paul, the apostle, makes it quite plain that salvation from sin and death is only possible through the Lord Jesus Christ. As he said in Romans chapter six, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so here's some good news that through Jesus, God is prepared to give us eternal life if we obey him. And so this is the hope of salvation that the Bible extends to each one of us, the hope of salvation from sin and death. And that surely is a cause of great joy and rejoicing. Now, just have a look at these words that Paul wrote later on in the letter to the Romans in chapter 15. He said, now, I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God, to confirm the promises made unto the fathers, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, for this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles, and sing unto thy name. And again he saith, Rejoice ye Gentiles with his people, and again praise the Lord all ye Gentiles, and laud him all ye people. And so what Paul is saying here is that the purpose of the ministry of Jesus was to preach the truth of God to both Jews and Gentiles. And because of that, we should rejoice and praise the Lord. But I want us to notice that the Apostle Paul very carefully explains to us here what the truth of God consists of. And it's the end of verse eight when he says to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. Now, that's 
really important because what that means is that if we want to understand the truth of God and to rejoice in the hope of salvation offered to us by Jesus Christ, then we must understand about the promises made unto the fathers. And this is the consistent teaching of the Bible. The hope of salvation that the Bible speaks about has to do with the promises made unto the fathers. I'd like us to just turn up now three verses, all taken from the Acts of the Apostles, that help us to, to sort of crystallise the hope that the Bible speaks about. And each of these three verses were originally written by or spoken by the Apostle Paul. So the first one is in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 28 and verse 20. And Paul says here, He says, for this cause, therefore, have I called for you to see you and to speak with you. Because that for the hope of Israel. I am bound with this chain. So Paul speaks there about the hope of Israel. Now, just turn back a couple of pages to Acts chapter 26 and see what Paul says in verse six. And here Paul is on trial before Agrippa. And he says in verse six, and now I stand and I'm judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers. Unto which promise our 12 tribes instantly serving God day and night hope to come. For which hope's sake, King Agrippa I am accused of the Jews. So here Paul speaks about the hope of the promise of God made unto the fathers. And again, if we just turn back another couple of pages and find chapter 23. In verse six, it says this. But when Paul perceived that the one part was Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, of the hope and resurrection of the dead. I am called in question. And so in each of these three references from the Acts of the Apostles, Paul speaks about hope. And just from a simple reading of these verses, we can see that the, the hope that Paul was speaking about has something to do with Israel. It has to do with the promises God made to the fathers, and that is the, the fathers of the Jewish nation, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And here in Acts 23, it incorporates the hope of resurrection from the dead. And the message of the Bible is that this hope that Paul had can also be our hope too. And it ex it's explained in detail in the Bible, and it runs like a golden thread through the Bible, both Old Testament and New Testament. You see, the Bible talks about the gospel, and that word gospel means good news. So the Bible contains good news that can give us hope. And when we look at the world today, Good news and hope is something that is in very short supply. But the Bible gives us good news. It gives us hope. And the good news of the gospel is consistent. It doesn't matter where you look in the Bible. The gospel hope that the Bible speaks about is the same. Just, just have a look at this verse that we find in the letter to the Galatians and chapter 3 where Paul says, and the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen or the Gentiles through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, in thee shall all nations 
be blessed. Now, I suspect that many of us would find these words at first glance a little bit surprising because Paul says here that the good news, the gospel, was preached to Abraham when God said to Abraham, in thee shall all nations be blessed. And I suspect that most people would associate the gospel with the work and the teaching of Jesus that we read about in the New Testament. And that is certainly true. Jesus did preach the gospel. and We have the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. But Paul tells us here that actually the gospel was preached to Abraham. And we read about him way back in the Bible, in the very first book of the Bible, in the book of Genesis. And so this is important. If we want to know what the gospel is, then the Apostle Paul is telling us that we need to know about Abraham. We must understand about the promises that God made to Abraham, because this is what constitutes true gospel hope. And there's absolutely no doubt that Abraham is a very important person in the Bible story, because his name appears 280 times in the Bible, and 70 of them are actually in the New Testament. And time and time again in the pages of the Bible, God reveals himself to men as the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. Let's just turn in our Bibles to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. Uh, and this chapter is all about Abraham. Now, see what it says in verse 13. Concerning Abraham, it says here, for the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. What, what an astounding verse that is. It tells us here that Abraham was promised that he should be the heir of the world. And so that helps to give us a measure of how important this man is with respect to the purpose of God. Now, why is Abraham so important? Well, this verse that we've just read tells us why. It was because of his faith. Abraham, you see, he was a man of supreme faith. He believed God. That's what faith means, belief. He believed God. He trusted God implicitly. And the Apostle Paul gives us an example of this in, in the later part of this chapter. Because God didn't just prom promise Abraham that he would be the heir of the world, remarkable though that is in itself. He also promised him that he would be the father of many nations. Let's have a look at verse 17. It says, as it is written... I have made thee, Abraham, a father of many nations. But, you know, when we read about the life of Abraham in the book of Genesis, we discover that he had a real problem because he had no children and his wife, Sarah, was barren. And even when Abraham reached the ripe old age of 99, he still had no children in spite of this promise that God made to him here, that he would be a father of many nations. So what did, God, what did Abraham do? Did he conclude that God was unfaithful to his word? Well, absolutely he did not. He believed, he had faith that God's promise would be fulfilled. And so it was that when he was a hundred years old, God miraculously gave him a son whom he called Isaac. Let's just read about the strength of this man's faith. Verse 18, it says, who against hope believed in hope 
that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. And so Abraham believed God and his belief was counted to him for righteousness. And that's why God promised Abraham that he would be the heir of the world. Now, the point for us is this, that if we also have faith in God, if we also believe in God's word, then God is willing to count us righteous, even though we're not righteous. And we can then share in the promises that God made with Abraham. And that's what it says here in verse 23. It says, now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offences and was raised again for our justification. And so this is what we have to believe. We have to believe that God raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. And if we believe that, and if we live out our lives in obedience to God, then God promises to us that we also will inherit the world with faithful Abraham. And what I'd like us to do now is just put a little bit more uh, detail into the story and find out a little bit more about this man, Abraham. And while we're doing so, let's not forget that Paul in Galatians chapter three has told us that the promises that God made to Abraham are the very essence of the gospel that gives us the hope of salvation from sin and death. Now, the Bible tells us that Abraham came from a place called Ur of the Chaldees. And there it is in the bottom right hand corner of the map in modern day Iraq. And archaeological findings have confirmed that Ur was a city on the banks of the river Euphrates. It was a place of luxury, very civilized place. It was the home to a highly sophisticated community. It was a center of culture and learning. They found libraries containing lots of books from Ur of the Chaldees. And so from the point of view of the world, it was a really good place to live in. But the problem with Ur of the Chaldees was that it was also full of idolatry and in particular it was the headquarters for the worship of the moon goddess and in fact the bible tells us that abraham's own family worshipped idols Let's look at this verse from the book of joshua chapter 24 it says that joshua said unto all the people thus saith the lord god of israel your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood that's the river, the river Euphrates, in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nahor, and they served other gods. So even Abraham's family worshipped idols. But in spite of this background, God, with his foreknowledge, knew that Abraham was a very special man. God knew that Abraham would respond to his commandments, but it would mean Abraham getting out of that idolatrous place. And so God commanded Abraham to get out of Ur of the Chaldees, to leave his hometown and his family, and to go to a land that he'd never seen before. 
And we find the story in the book of Genesis in chapter 12. So let's just turn up Genesis chapter 12. And it's in verse 1 where it says that the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. Now, let's just think for a moment about what God was asking Abraham to do here. He was asking him to leave behind all the comforts and the advantages that Ur of the Chaldees had to offer. But not only that, he was asking him to leave his family and his friends and to travel to a far off land that he'd never set eyes on before. And he didn't even know how to find it. And yet Abraham obeyed. And here again is a measure of this man's dependence and his implicit trust on God's word. In fact, one of the New Testament writers, the writer to the Hebrews, says this. He says, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out onto a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whither he went. And it was as a result of Abraham's faith and obedience to this commandment that God gave to him to leave her of the cold ease, that God then made to him a series of promises and they're recorded for us here in Genesis chapter 12. Let's just read these verses together. Beginning at verse 2, God says, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. And then in verse seven, it says that the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, unto thy seed will I give this land. And I want us to note in particular that promise there that God promised Abraham that he would have an offspring. He would be given a seed who would be given the land of Israel, the promised land, for a possession. And in fact, if you just turn over the page to Genesis chapter 13, you will see that this promise was repeated with a very significant addition. In Genesis chapter 13 and verse 14, it says that the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot was separated from him, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art, northward and southward and eastward and westward, for all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it and to thy seed forever. And so again, the land was promised to Abraham's seed. But you notice that it was also promised to Abraham himself. And furthermore, it was promised to Abraham and to his seed forever. And that's important. And we'll come back to that in a moment. But just for the moment, just turn on a couple of pages more to Genesis chapter 15, because here again, we find the same promise repeated with modifications. Genesis chapter 15 and verse 18, it says, in the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. And so here we're given some of the, the geographical boundaries of the land that was promised to Abraham's seed, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. But did you notice that this verse is written in the past tense? God said unto thy seed, have I given this land? In other words, as far as God was concerned, it was as good as done. And here's a remarkable thing, because at this point in his life, Abraham still had no child. He still had no children. And yet God says here that he'd given the land to his seed. In fact, we're told this at the beginning of Genesis chapter 15. Look at verse 3. 
It says, Abraham said, behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto them, said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And so here again, we've got a, a wonderful demonstration of this, this great man's faith. God told him he would have a seed. Abraham believed and God countered that belief to him for righteousness. And so it was that, as we've seen, God eventually blessed Abraham with a son whom he called Isaac when Abraham was a hundred years old. And so by doing so in a miraculous way, God prepared the way for the fulfillment of the promises concerning Abraham and his seed inheriting the land. But we need to be very clear in our minds that Isaac the son of Abraham, was not the seed of Abraham. He was not the promised seed. The seed of Abraham would come through Isaac, that's true, but it was not Isaac. And we know that because of something that the Apostle Paul wrote back in Galatians chapter 3, where he said this, he said, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not and to seeds as of many, but as of one and to thy seed, which is Christ. If you think about the word seed, it's, it's an ambiguous word. It can be singular or plural in much the same way that you can have one sheep or a flock of sheep. The word seed is the same. It can be either singular or plural. But Paul here is making the point that without question, the seed of Abraham is one person. It is, in fact, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know that Jesus was directly descended from Abraham through Isaac. In fact, the genealogy of Jesus that's recorded for us back in Matthew chapter 1, the very first verse of the New Testament says, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And so without question, the seed of Abraham is Jesus Christ. So says the Apostle Paul. Jesus is that particular ancestor that God promised to Abraham and God promised that Abraham and his seed the Lord Jesus Christ would be given the land of Israel for an everlasting possession so the question is well when was that fulfilled and the answer is that it hasn't been Abraham never was given the promised land in fact, the only bit of land that Abraham ever owned was a small field that he bought with money where he buried Sarah, his wife. And apart from that small field, Abraham owned nothing of the, la of the promised land. And this very point is made for us in the New Testament in Acts chapter 7, where Stephen says concerning Abraham, he says that God gave him non-inheritance in it. No, not so much as to set his foot on, yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession and to his seed after him, when as yet he had no child. So the fact is that Abraham never did receive the promised land. What about Jesus, the seed of Abraham? 
has Jesus inherited the land? And again, the answer is no, because when Jesus came 2000 years ago, as the heir to the throne of David in Jerusalem, we know what happened to him. He was rejected by his own fellow countrymen, by the Jews, and he was put to death. And shortly after he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven where he remains to this day. So the fact is that neither Abraham nor his seed have inherited the land. And yet God said that they would. So does this mean that God tells lies? Is God's word not to be trusted? Well, of course not. What it does mean is that the fulfillment of this promise is still in the future. And one of the most fundamental aspects of the gospel message is that Jesus Christ is going to return to the earth. He's going to come back to establish his throne in Jerusalem and to restore Israel as the kingdom of God. We read in the Acts of the Apostles that after Jesus rose again from the dead, he spent 40 days with his disciples and, and much of that time was taken speaking to his disciples about the coming of the kingdom of God. Uh, and this was what the disciples of Jesus were looking for, the establishment of the kingdom of God in Israel, the restoration of the nation of Israel as God's kingdom, like it had been in the good old days when David and Solomon reigned from Jerusalem. God had promised Abraham, I will make of thee a great nation. And the disciples of Jesus were eagerly anticipating that time when that promise would be fulfilled, when the Jewish nation would become great and Jesus Christ would reign as king from Zion. But Jesus had to explain to his disciples that that was not going to happen at that particular time. And then shortly afterwards, we read in the Acts of the Apostles how that Jesus was taken up from them into heaven. And while, Je while the disciples were watching Jesus ascend into heaven, no doubt very confused, wondering how the promises could ever be fulfilled if Jesus wasn't on the earth, two angels appeared to the disciples and explained. And this is what they said in Acts chapter 1 and verse 10. It says that while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. And so this is one of the most fundamental, basic aspects of the gospel message that Jesus Christ is coming back again to the earth and it's at that time when he comes again that he will restore the kingdom to Israel and Israel will become a great and mighty nation just as God had promised to Abraham and it's at that time that Jesus and Abraham will inherit the land forever just as God promised. This is the kingdom of God that the Bible speaks so much about, a real political kingdom that will be established upon the earth with Jesus as king initially in the land of Israel. But ultimately, the dominion of Jesus will extend over the whole earth and it will bring untold blessings for all mankind and lasting solutions to all the problems that the world faces today. But let's just think for, about Abraham for a moment, because of course Abraham is dead and buried. He's been so for 4,000 years. So how can Abraham possibly inherit the promised land forever? And of course, there's only one way 
And that introduces us to the very important doctrine of the resurrection from the dead. Remember what Paul said in the Acts of the Apostles? He said, of the hope and resurrection from the dead, I am called in question. And the Bible has a lot to say about the resurrection from the dead. And this doctrine is a, another key foundation of the gospel message that those who have died in faith will be raised again from the dead when the Lord Jesus comes. And without doubt, Abraham will be amongst those that rise again in that day, because Jesus himself said so on more than one occasion. Just have a look at these words on the screen from Luke chapter 20, where Jesus said to the Jews, he said, now that the dead are raised, even Moses showed at the bush when he calleth the Lord, the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob, for he is not a God of the dead, but of the living, for all live unto him. So Jesus is saying that the very fact that God calls himself the God of Abraham proves that Abraham will rise from the dead because God isn't a God of dead people but of living people. And so it will thus be at the resurrection that Abraham will rise again and he will receive the land promised to him forever. And it's at that time that Abraham will be blessed and his name will become great. In fact, Jesus made it clear that Abraham will be a, a very important person in the future kingdom of God. In Matthew chapter 8, Jesus said, I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Can you see how wonderfully harmonious the whole of the gospel message is? When God made promises to Abraham, those promises constituted the gospel and the New Testament shows to us how the, the fulfillment of these promises revolve around the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth to establish his kingdom and the resurrection from the dead. And so from the very beginning of the Bible to its end, the teaching is consistent because the Bible is really is what it claims to be. It's the word of the living God. But the question is really, well, how does this all affect you and me? What we really want to know is how the promises given to Abraham give us hope of salvation and the cause for rejoicing. Well, the answer to that lies in another of the promises that God made to Abraham. And if you remember back in Genesis chapter 12, God said to Abraham, in thee, shall all families of the earth be blessed. And later on in his life, God repeated this same promise to him again, and he expanded it to include a reference to Abraham's seed. In Genesis 22, God said, and in thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. And we now know that Abraham's seed is Jesus. So God is telling Abraham here that all people of the earth, not just the direct descendants of Abraham, but all people of the earth can be blessed through Abraham and his seed, Jesus Christ. And this is where we fit into the picture. And if we just go back to Galatians chapter 3, we shall see how that the Apostle Paul explains very clearly to us what this promise means and, and that the explanation that he gives goes right to the heart of the gospel message of salvation. Because in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 24, Paul says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Just notice that. Just as Abraham was accounted righteous because of his faith, Paul says that so can we 
be justified by faith, just like Abraham was. Then he says, but after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptised into Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And so what Paul is saying here is that if we have faith in God, like Abraham did, then we are God's children, just as Abraham was. And Paul tells us that one of the ways that we are required to show our faith is by being baptised into Christ, as Paul says here, by putting on Christ, because it's by being baptised into Jesus Christ that we come into a relationship with his death and resurrection. And Jesus is Abraham's seed. And if we've put on Christ by baptism into him, then we too become Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And so baptism is the key. It is the means whereby we come into a special relationship with Jesus Christ, the seed of Abraham. And that's why on one occasion in his life, God, and we've just looked at it in Genesis chapter 15, God invited Abraham to look into heaven and to see if he could count the stars. And God said to him, so shall thy seed be. So Abraham's seed would become as numerous as the stars of heaven for multitude. And so this is important. It's by putting on Christ, by becoming Abraham's seed by faith, that we become heirs of the promises. And so Paul says in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 8, and the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, in thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. So anybody who has faith, all who believe God and show it by being baptised, will be blessed with faithful Abraham. As God said to Abraham, in thee shall all nations be blessed. So the blessing of the promise is open to everyone who shows the same faith as Abraham did. But here's a question. What is this blessing? When God said to Abraham, in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed, what is that blessing mentioned in the promise? Well, can we just turn finally to the Acts of the Apostles in chapter 3? Because here the Apostle Paul explains for us what the blessing of the promise is. So Acts chapter 3 and verse 25. Where Peter says, he says, ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, and in thy seed shall all kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first, God, having raised up his son, Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. And so Peter explains to us here that actually the blessing of the promise is the forgiveness of sins, turning away every one of you from his iniquities. It's the forgiveness of sins that is available to us if we but believe that Jesus was delivered for our offences and was raised again for our justification. And if we show that belief by being baptised. But of course, it's not just the forgiveness of our sins, because if we take advantage of this wonderful blessing, 
then what the scriptures are telling us is that we can look forward to the same future as Abraham. We can have the hope of resurrection and everlasting life and an inheritance in the kingdom of God on the earth with Abraham and his seed. As Jesus himself said to his disciples, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Thank you.